Welcome back inside the uh, UN Climate Talks here in Durban, South Africa. Uh, we've just been talking a little bit about money, finance, uh, the things that make uh, this process go round. Uh, now we're joined by Ellie Johnston of an organization called Climate Interactive. Um, Climate Interactive is quite interesting. Uh, we've been everyone, It seems that everyone here in this conference center, whether it's a, a negotiator, uh, an NGO, an activist, uh, an academic, everyone seems to agree we need to cut emissions. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The question is how much and when. Uh, we've had bureaucrats talking about that, we've had politicians talking about it, we've had civil society talking about it. We're going to bring you a little math and science now um, to sort of break down what, what needs to happen and when. Uh, Climate Interactive does something called the Climate Scoreboard. Uh, so Ellie, tell us what is, what is the Climate Scoreboard? Yeah, so the Climate Scoreboard is a animation that shows, that adds up all the commitments that na nations have put forward and runs analysis using our sea roads model um, to tell us you know what that is going to mean in terms of temperature rise in 2100. So basically um, at these conferences and particularly at the last conference in Cancun most of the countries of the world put targets on the table and said we're going to cut our emissions by this much mm -hmm. and uh, and so basically you took all that that those commitments and you ran the numbers yeah. and what did you find out what does that mean for the for the world down the road if everyone does what they say they're gonna do yeah so if ever if everyone goes about business as usual and that takes let, me, us let me just say while we're doing this Jamie can we pull up that that video we're gonna pull up a we're gonna pull up a little uh, screenshot now that that shows exactly what we're looking at here while we're talking over it yeah so if we were to just go about business as usual uh, we would be around five degrees temp five degrees Celsius um, and temperature rise. So that's five degrees of temperature rise since we started the industrial period about a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. is that right? Mm -hmm. um, and then if we, in, if we were to enact all of the commitments on the table coming out of Cancun and since then um, some nations have adjusted their mitigation targets a little bit, um, we would see 4.3 degrees. So, ba so basically, the way the world is going now, if no one does anything to try and cut back their, their carbon uh, output, their greenhouse gas output, we're going to rise by 5 degrees. Mm -hmm. If everyone does what they said they're going to do, we're, only, we're still going to rise by 4.3 degrees. We've only basically yeah. cut less than 1 degree of temperature rise out of the system through all the pledges. Yeah, exactly. And so we're trying to get to 2 degrees. Um, that's what is in the, it's in the agreement, you know, 2 degrees or below. Um, but we're still, there's a, still a huge gap there. So, so why two degrees? Why, why is this number two degrees so important? Well, two degrees is the uh, t level of temperature rise put forward. Um, many say it's a lot less. A lot of, a lot of countries, um, the island nations, are advocating around 1.5 degrees. These, these are the temperature rises that are going to um, help prevent runaway climate change. These feedback loops are really powerful and there's there's a lot of um, just sort of positive feedbacks that will kick in, especially as we see more and more um, temperature rise. The IPCC just a couple weeks ago released a report talking about extreme weather and how with greater temperature rise we're going to see more and more extreme weather events. This means, you know, greater money that's going to need to go to towards adaptation and it ultimately means lives. Um, and when we have disasters strike. And if I'm correct, I believe we're already at, you know, close three quarters of a degrees of warming that we've seen. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's more warming that's already sort of locked into the system. Is that right? So we're heading up towards that two degrees already? Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the carbon emissions, they'd, if we were to just stop emitting carbon today, we would still have a lot of carbon dioxide that we had put into the atmosphere that it wouldn't go away just tomorrow. And there's there's these delays in the system um, that we have to account for in thinking about reducing emissions. And we can't just level off emissions right now. We actually have to reduce them to compensate for the emissions we've already emitted. So basically, we're, we're on this target that as of now, the way people are talking, we're headed towards four degrees of, of temperature rise over this century, by the, by the end of this century. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for the planet, four degrees of temperature rise or more? Well, it means all kinds of things. I mean, the IPCC, they have an extensive document t just talking about you know, rising sea levels, extreme weather that I just mentioned a, a second ago, you know, melting glaciers, that means reduce, you know, water scarcity in some areas, it means droughts in other areas, torrential downpour. The, the, the thing about climate change is that it makes, um, it'll, it'll just change our weather patterns and, and change the way certain, certain ecosystems, certain areas um, change their climates drastically and people and 
all the other species are going to have to to adapt to that and react to that in different ways. So we've heard a lot of organizations here over the past week calling for, the, the, the term we keep hearing is more ambition. Yeah. They want more ambitious targets. Uh, what exactly does that mean? Well, just looking at the climate scoreboard, we see this difference. We, we see, you know, current commitments on the table get us to 4.3 degrees rise, but what, we, what everyone, what a lot of folks want is two degrees or less. Um, and so closing that gap is really that level of ambition. We need nations to come to the table with that level of ambition to get to two degrees, not to not to 4.3, not to four degrees, but all the way down so that island nations and, uh, and others will survive. So, and the U.S. is a major player on all of this here. Uh, what have they come to the table with here, here in Durban? Yeah, so what we're hearing from the U.S. State Department um, in the last week of the negotiations has been that they're saying that the commitments we have on the table are mostly um, end in 2020. And they're, they're saying that those, we're okay with those and that we need to look at commitments from 2020 and beyond. And that's really where the, the U.S. State Department is saying that that's where we'll find our increased level of ambition. So they're, they're saying that um, their approach is to negotiate something new that would start in 2020, but not change anything that's on the table B between now and then. Yeah, that's right. And so you guys have run some numbers. Jamie, if we can pull up that, uh, that second graph now. You guys have run some more numbers about what exactly that means if we don't change anything that's on the table right now until mm -hmm. 2020. Yeah, so what we're, what we're looking at is if we, just, we, if we enact the current commitments on the table, we're still going to see um, emissions increasing. And what we need to do is re really find a peak in emissions. And so we ran two different analysis um, using the Sea Roads, C -Roads model. Um, and in one of those, we said amb ambition now. What does ambition now look like? And what we're seeing is that that would be like a 2.3% reduction in emissions per year. Um, and th these are both of the, tr the different scenarios that we looked at. Um, were a two degree scenario. So how can we get to two degrees? If we wait until 2020 to really bring that level of ambition, to really start reducing our emissions, we're going to have to reduce our emissions 4% 4 4 per year to get to two degrees or less um, in 2100. Give us a sense. Is that a lot, 4% 4, 4 per year? So a lot of the energy um, analysis models out there are suggesting that three to three point five percent are some are is a pretty ambitious reductions amount, and so four percent is that much higher. Um, whether or not we can do that is in question, but it, clearly it'll be enormously difficult. So if we if we don't start uh, on a new path until 2020, we have to at that point reduce by four percent a year to mm -hmm. get to where we want to get to by 20 by the end of the century. Yeah. If we start now, yeah. what do we have to do? We just have to, well, we have to reduce our emissions 2.3% per year around so, there. So am I right in understanding that that's basically, you know, half as difficult? Yeah. I mean, in theory, there is a lot of, it's, it's a complex thing. And to boil it down to that, it, it is... Uh, a little oversimplified. Yeah. Yeah. But, but basically, the, the amount of money it will take, the amount of uh, effort it will take is much greater. And it's getting beyond those levels that a lot of different um, energy scenarios are looking at as and they, they haven't even analyzed, analyzed those upper limits. Um, not to say that they aren't possible, but it's not, you know, it's not with, within what, it, what is being currently looked at as feasible. So, so what exactly would that mean if we, if we waited till 2020 as the U.S. seems to be pushing the entire world to do uh, and then started reducing, reducing greenhouse gas emissions more steeply? What's wrong with that? What, what, are the, what are the negative problems with that? Yeah, well, I mean, first and foremost, it's going to cost a lot of money. There's a, there is infrastructure there that needs to be changed, you know, energy infrastructure that gets locked in when we build coal plants. We can't just tear them down the next year. It's, there's a, a lock-in effect that goes on. And so we would have to spend that much more money. And, and already in these times where dollars count so much and, and the economy is just not, not looking that, that great, it's really scary for me as a young person to be thinking about delaying this action to where it's going to cost even more. So delay is costly. So um, how are you guys getting this information out there? How is this, how is this, uh, this math, all these, uh, these studies that you've done, how are people using it? 
Oh, well, we use it in lots of different ways. I mean, the climate scoreboard is online and uh, freely available to anyone who wants to embed it on their blog or whatever. Two weeks ago, we just la launched an iPhone app um, called Climate Pathways, and so people can download that and play with the numbers there. Um, we have the, our Sea Roads model, which is uh, freely available to anyone off of our website, and negotiating teams use that in analyzing national commitments and where that stands. Uh, our stuff is used in classrooms, and it's used here in Durban. And who developed all this all this stuff here? How 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 do we know we can trust your numbers? Uh, yeah, so a lot of the analysis is based on the Sea Roads model, which is a systems dynamics uh, computer model. It was developed um, by the the team at Climate Interactive and um, with in partnership with MIT University. Uh, it was peer reviewed, led by a team. The peer review team was led by Bob Carell, who's a former head of the IPCC, and um, other scientists who took a look at what we were what we're doing and, and said, looked at the analysis and the assumptions behind it, and and gave it gave it their approval. So we fa had an external scientific review of the of the analysis and the tools that we're using to come out with these numbers. So just tell us one more time, if people want to go online and play around with the numbers, download the iPhone app, and see how all this stuff works, where do they go? climateinteractive.org. Okay. Thank you very much, Ellie. Thank you. So um, that's, that's where you can find all the numbers. You can play around with the background stuff, the science, uh, get a sense of, of what, what's going to happen if we do X, what's going to happen if we do Y, and make your own decisions about you know, where do you think things should be going with these negotiations here uh, in Durban. Uh, next, we're going to bring you an interview. Uh, I think we've got it queued up with uh, Steve Sawyer, who's um, uh, with Roland. Oh, we're going to... Uh, oh, sorry, Angola. Excellent. Um, just a few minutes ago, around the corner here, um, the Angolan Minister of Environment uh, was talking about the issues that they face in Angola. I think it's really important to remember, uh, as we're looking at the science, we're looking at the politics here, ultimately this is about people's lives. And it's people in Africa we're hearing over and over again who are going to be impacted the most uh, and the soonest, and they're already facing the impacts of climate change. So let's, uh, let's take a look at the interview with the, the Minister of Environment from Angola and get a little sense of, uh, of what's happening on the ground in that country.